Thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to talk about uh, something that is very close to my art and uh, very close to what I did uh, in my life of the last uh, 36 years. By the way, uh, I was also in 2013 Minister of Labor and Social Policy, so I had to experience, let's say, uh, how to use data and from the other side. So for many years, I tried to build data and uh, evidence, but then I also saw the other side, uh, how difficult uh, can be to, to do policies. And actually, let me start from here, because uh, one of the policies that uh, we launched was the Youth Guarantee, which is a system to be sure that uh, young people, when they leave uh, education, uh, when they are unemployed and so on, they get a proposal within four months uh, to do training, uh, to get a job, and so on and so forth. So in designing uh, the Youth Guarantee for Italy, I also included a weekly monitoring uh, of uh, what was going on. So every week, the, there is a report about the number of people who registered in the website, uh, what happened to them, how many of them were taken on charge <coughs> by the public services, and so on and so forth. And I had designed the weekly system for monitoring, uh, hoping and thinking that if something went wrong, uh, the ministry had to intervene and do something. My successor confirmed this, but there wasn't any single intervention in uh, some regions, for example, in the south of Italy, where things were not going very well. So data were there, very timely, very disaggregated, also at micro level, you could see what happened to uh, young people, but no action. This is, of course, very clear demonstration that data are not enough to make decisions and to make the right decision. There must be something else. And, uh, oh, sorry. <coughs> so the effort that you are doing uh, on data production analysis and forecasts and so on, is it worth doing? Is, this, is it really helpful? In our report uh, on the Data Revolution for Sustainable Development of a panel that I co-chaired uh, for the UN Secretary General in 2014, uh, the report starts with these sentences. Would you subscribe to them? Is there anybody objecting? No? Great. This is the must. This is an article published on New York Times on 24th August. This is the myth. By the way, I really recommend you to read uh, this article. Uh, in my presentation today, I will point you to some reports and books and so on, so you can go much further what I can say in this time. And it's interesting uh, that uh, this is exactly the problem of the data revolution. The data revolution is just uh, a proliferation of uh, data, data producers, and so on. So we risk to be killed by data. But as uh, the vacuum is uh, filled by someone, according to William Davis, someone is taking all this data and they are doing uh, very diverse, I would say, activities, even contradictory. But the point that he made here in his paper, in, in his article, is also that today, there is a sentence like this, every politician can find at least uh, one research center 
paid by him, of course, able to use some data to confirm uh, what the politician is saying. You may have seen that 70% of facts quoted by Donald Trump are false. And in the article, uh, Davis says, well, in an evidence-based decision-making world, he would have been immediately dismissed. But this is not the case. So, what kind of world are we living in? Is the world that we are talking about here, or is it something different? And even The Economist this week is addressing uh, this issue. Now, let me uh, tell you how innocent I was, I hope still, um, <laughs> years ago, when I was chief statistician at the OECD. In 2004, I organized the first OECD World Forum on Statistics, Knowledge, and Policy. That was exactly the chain that I had in mind uh, uh, about how the world should work and what is the value added of our work. And uh, by the way, I will come back later, uh, that event was also the beginning of the movement to go beyond GDP. And I will use it as an example. In 2007, at the second OECD World Forum, 1,200 people, 130 countries, the largest OECD event in his long history, we signed a declaration. When I say we, I mean, I mean uh, World Bank, uh, UN, uh, uh, IMF, uh, um, OECD, Conference of Islamic Countries, and so on. And by the way, in the declaration, we start saying a culture of evidence-based decision-making has to be promoted at all levels. But also, the last point, we urge statistical offices and others to work uh, with the representatives of their communities to produce high quality facts-based information, and that is the key message, to be used by all society to form, second point, a shared view. You may know that the origin of uh, the word, word statistics is the science of the state. And you can use it with the lower state, so the state of play, but also the capital letter. And why are we spending money to produce statistics? Years ago, I lost a lot of friends in my community of uh, chief statisticians because I said to them, look, I seen, I've seen so many papers around the world about measuring almost everything. Have you ever seen a paper trying to measure the value added of what we do? In national accounts, we go to try to measure very tiny sectors. What about official statistics? So I went to look at the Bible of official statistics. And uh, you can find that official statistics is classified in the public sector, uh, non-market services, under the sub-sector uh, economic and social planning and the production of statistics. So fine, we produce a service, not a good, okay? Where does the value of a service come from? According to national accounts, uh, the other Bible, the system of national accounts, the value of a service depends on the change that the consumer experiments after uh, consuming the service. In other words, you may have uh, services that change the physical state of the consumer or services that change the mental state. What kind of service, what kind of change should the consumption of statistics produce in a consumer? My answer is knowledge. According to national accounts, producing statistics without transforming this into knowledge is useless. 
as a zero value of the production minus the costs as a negative value added. But why are, do we spend money to produce statistics for policymaking? You can find a lot of interesting uh, models about how democracy works, and especially models based on game theory applied to democracy. You have uh, two agents, one is the principal and the other is the agent, citizen and politician. And normally citizens vote only when they think that the utility of voting is higher than costs. But all these uh, models show that there is uh, an information asymmetry between uh, what politicians know and what citizens know. Politicians sell platforms to meet the demand uh, from uh, citizens. So it's a demand supply game, okay? But once elected, politicians know much more about what's going on than citizens. Therefore, they can do what they want instead of doing what, what citizens want. It's the same for managers of large corporations. This asymmetric information explains why the system is not good enough to choose the best politician. Statistics is supposed to fill the gap. Statistics are supposed to increase the shared knowledge, and so you can understand uh, what are the problems that politicians should uh, address, what are the solutions that are promising or proposing, what are the results of their action. This is why we spend money on statistics, according to this model. So the conclusion is that uh, if citizens could know the state of play statistics about the state of the world, then the game uh, would become efficient and therefore the welfare loss to these asymmetric information would be minimized. And the, the best politicians would be selected in order to do what citizens want. Okay? Great. Forget about this. Completely. Because neurosciences tell us a completely different story. I will come back in a second. I try to put this in a formula. So this is the value added of statistics, not any more official statistics, okay? Because now everybody can put together data. And uh, the value of statistics, if you wish, is a function of different uh, elements. First, the quantity of data produced, the role that media play in disseminating this information to citizens are, but then uh, you have uh, the individual's perspective. And the uh, probability of transforming uh, that information reached through, that received uh, through media is, depends on the relevance of that information, the trust I have uh, in the source, and my capacity, my numeracy, the capacity of uh, transforming those figures into knowledge. It's enough that one of these elements is zero, that the entire chain uh, is broken. And the value of the production is zero. And the value added is negative as you have the costs. So we are working a lot in the production of statistics data. We are struggling, uh, we are struggling uh, with how to present this to the decision maker. But then, finally, the, our value added depends on the relevance, the trust, and uh, the numeracy. In 2010, once I went back uh, from the OECD and became president of the Italian Statistical Office, opening uh, the biannual conference on uh, st 
statistics in Italy. I issued this paper, you can find it by the way in English as well, Statistics 2.0, the next level, where I figure out that official statistics is, was, is at high risk. Six years ago, some tendencies in terms of proliferation of sources, in terms of data revolution were already clear. On the other hand, we were seeing uh, the budget of national statistical offices being cut almost everywhere. And of course, statisticians were complaining, saying politicians don't understand uh, uh, the importance of our work and so on and so forth. But my point was, was that just a result of a reduction of our value added? So politicians were correctly investing uh, on uh, much more promising sources of data. They, they were growing, the share of statistics, the amount of statistics was growing but at lower pace, so the composition was changing and therefore it could have been very reasonable, rational for politicians saying why should I spend so much money in doing this kind of uh, bloody official statistics that, by the way, um, don't follow my orders. Because official statistics uh, has its own, uh, let's say, principles uh, and uh, independency, so they don't necessarily follow what uh, the politicians want. So my point was, is our job at risk? And my answer in 2006 was yes. Can you imagine what I'm thinking today? Trying to help uh, to uh, understand uh, how these complicated games are moving and uh, the elements of that. In 2014, uh, I published this book. I'm sorry, only in, in Italian. But actually, the title, the original title, was not to choose in the future, but was go governing without knowing. But then my editor said, well, this book is going to be published only after two months you left the government. So this could be seen as a criticism to the new government, of young guys, very inexperienced. So I decided to change the title. So is uh, uh, choosing the future knowledge and politics in the age of big data where I try to, starting from the models I mentioned before, I try also to look at what neuroscience and behavioral economics tell us about our decision-making processes, how our brain and our feeling guts fight against each other and the way in which we make decisions. Because neuroscience and behavioral economics are telling us that uh, we take 99% of our decisions from uh, the non-rational part of us. And it works. It's, it's what uh, um, is called uh, um, in, the, uh, in this field, uh, the, uh, the shortcomings to make decisions are, um, are called uh, um, well, I forgot the, the right name now. Um, I will come, it will come back. I recommend you to look at this book by Drew Westin, The Political Brain. The subtitle of the book is Why Americans Love Democrats and Vote for Republicans. And one of the, is a review of 50 years of uh, uh, presidential campaigns in light of uh, the neurosciences and what we know about our brain and heart uh, works. And the conclusion is that, uh, as I said, heuristics, this is uh, the word that I was looking for, are shortcuts to make uh, the right decisions, is that uh, evidence 
doesn't play a so big role as uh, we would like. Notwithstanding that, it's true that data are still relevant to set up the overall discourse about what's going on better, what uh, is uh, worsening, and so on and so forth. So it's helpful to identify what are the problems. The key question is, are they also useful to design the solution? Which is much more complicated. And let me take uh, the example that I mentioned before. In 2004, I started this uh, movement on beyond GDP. You may have heard about the Stiglitz then C Commission and many others. Those were all follow-ups of that initiative. And so we made a lot of process of progress. Now we have a lot of uh, evidence. We have a lot of uh, good reasons why we should abandon GDP as a measure of success. By the way, if you are interested in this topic, look at the book published a few months ago the, for the Columbia University Press, uh, and the title of the book is The Power of a Single Number, which describes, among other things, the origin of the choice of uh, uh, GDP. The, that was not done by uh, Kuznets uh, or uh, Richard Stone or Mead. Uh, this was done by the Department of Commerce of the US government. They called these guys together because they had different views. They locked them uh, in a room until the moment in which they decided uh, what the GDP should be about. Because there were two camps. One, the American one, the GDP had to be focused on welfare. The British one on production. And the Americans choose the British. Incredible, as we were in a different world. The British approach, because that was much more useful for the political plans they had for the post-World War. By the way, they were competing uh, with the Soviet Union about who had it the largest, who had the largest uh, GDP, of course. Um, so now we know that looking at GDP is not a great idea, that uh, we should move to something else. Of course, GDP was a good proxy for several decades about uh, other things, health, education, and so on and so forth. But now, look at this picture. The red curve is the GDP in uh, Euro area. The blue one is the household disposable income. Why should I follow GDP to understand how my people are doing. And if you look at the very last uh, uh, rows, you see that between 2004 and 2013, uh, GDP increased by 2%, not per year, in per capita terms, household disposable income uh, minus 5.5. So this is the difference between when politicians talk ab about the state of the economy and uh, the way in which people get it. By the way, look at the situation before the crisis. Where is that difference between uh, 109 and 102 went? In the good years, where that money went? Profits of multinationals, remittances of immigrants, and other stuff. So, the uh, trickle-down, you say, uh, approach that if you boost GDP, then money will go to everyone is not the case. By the way, if you are interested in these topics, look at a recent paper by the chief economist of the uh, Bank of UK, uh, Central Bank of UK, uh, showing uh, all the details about why the recovery in UK 
didn't change uh, uh, the life of the poorest, on the contrary. Obstacles to use GDP. So, sorry, the beyond GDP. This is the, from data to policy. A lot of obstacles. This is a summary of uh, uh, conclusions uh, made by few reports, um, made also in UK by a group uh, led by Gus O'Donnell, the former chief of uh, um, UK public administration. By the way, it was funny, last week, uh, the last weekend, uh, we were in the Stiglitz Commission too, in, at the OECD, and uh, there was a slide uh, quoting uh, something done by Gus O'Donnell, and of course, his initial are God. <laughs> so people, <laughs> God said that, God? <laughs> it, it was Gus. I'm quoting this because a lot of people from UK know exactly what I'm talking about and whom I'm talking about. Then you can say, so you wasted your time for more than 10 years. No. Finally. If you want to look at these sentences and especially the last one. Better to embrace a new approach than to ignore the progress that pervades modern life. Who said that? Wow. The Economist, who devoted the, the cover to this a few months ago and three articles. Great. So do you think that now politicians are looking to something else? Of course, no. But, but, there are some good examples. Let me quote uh, what we did uh, in Italy. Once I went back uh, from the OECD after 10 years, uh, 15 years, sorry, less, uh, five years of uh, push. We launched this uh, initiative on measuring uh, uh, what we call equitable and sustainable well-being. We involved the civil society, we involved the scientific commission, public consultation, and so on. And we ended, sorry, we followed a quite complex process, uh, engaging uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, scientists, and so on and so forth. And we ended with uh, two results. First, 12 domains, what matters for uh, Italy's well-being? and how to measure what matter. And we ended with uh, 134 indicators. These are the different uh, domains of our uh, well-being framework, which are not very far from uh, the other well-being frameworks developed around the world. By the way, they are not very far from the so-called uh, happiness index in Bhutan. What is the good news? That now, since July, the law stated that uh, in April, every year, the government has to uh, do an analysis before present, together with the plans for the future, they have to do an analysis of the last three years of these indicators, plus the forecasts for the following three years, based on the policies that the government wants to adopt. And then in February the following year, after the adoption of the budget law, the government has to make an assessment of the impact, expected impact, of the budget law on the indicators. It's a huge step, but also it's a huge challenge. My uh, friends in the Ministry of Finance uh, built, I think, a puppet doing some voodoo uh, against me because they have to do a hell of work now. Is it going to work? I don't know. But it's interesting that now we went to the end of the circle, the end of the process. Building data, 
now embedded in the political process, and then we'll see whether this really changed the story. I'm not the only believer in this kind of process, of course, around the world. And the sustainable development uh, goals, 17 goals, 169 indi targets, more than 230 indicators are now supposed to drive decisions all over the places uh, in all countries to try to rescue our world. This is what uh, uh, we try to help for in the report uh, that we published in 2014 that you can find on undatarevolution.org. I chaired uh, this group of experts and we made uh, several recommendations. I'm not going through them. There is one important point that, unfortunately, the UN missed completely, and so they are not taking actions on that. Data are not only necessary for monitoring, but also for achieving SDGs. As shown by the OECD very clearly in the report on data-driven innovation, data are an asset. Today, in the digital economy, data are an asset. Without any regulation, without any control, almost. Therefore, those who understood uh, how to exploit this asset are making uh, a lot of money. And the public sector is running behind. And they don't have a clue on how to exploit, manage, regulate these, the market of this new asset. There are huge problems, and in our recommendations, we looked at the principles and standards, including ethical issues, the governance and leadership, uh, the capacity resources, and technology and innovation. This is a, a whole research agenda, but especially policy agenda for the entire world. Unfortunately, the UN has mainly focused now on the statistical side of the story, um, trying to push countries to measure these indicators. And this is a huge challenge, and this is the state of the art. Maybe, maybe 60% of the indicators are available, especially for developed countries, not necessary for developing countries, that's, sorry, 35%. 25%, we have the methodologies, but we don't have the data. And for 40%, ix sunt leones, we don't have a clue on how to measure, which is not true. This is the approach taken by official statisticians who classified in the third tier indicators on peace, because they have never developed indicators about peace. But, for example, I'm just taking this example, the Institute for Economics and Peace, who publishes every year the Global Peace Index, has been, done, has been doing this now for several years. Why don't we use the, those data after a quality check? Why should we reinvent the wheel? But even if we had uh, the entire set of indicators, we would just be at the beginning of the story. This is the full world vision of uh, the whole system, our world system. We exchange uh, with the rest of the universe solar energy and waste heat. The rest is everything done within the planet. And uh, we use different uh, forms of capital to produce GDP. And then we decide how much we consume and how much we reinvest to rebuild uh, the different forms of capital. In doing that, we create waste but not only physical waste. In the Pope Francis sense, in his last encyclica, there are also the human waste. 
And of course, if you produce waste, this affects negatively the well-being, but also the way in which the production process is organized, slaves or free workers and so on, the well-being may change a lot. And then you have the ecological services, and then you have what I call social system services, and they have an influence on well-being, and well-being has a, a feedback loop on the different forms of capital. It's very complicated. Our world is quite complicated. And we just focused most of our efforts in measuring production process, GDP, that's it. The good news is that uh, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals refer to several parts of this system. This is why we don't have a clue on how to measure some of this stuff. Because these measurement systems come from a different perspective. What I'm trying to argue here is that not only that our data compilation and data analysis depends on the model we had in mind, human needs, production system, GDP that meets human needs, this was the old system, but now when we talk about sustainability, equity, inequalities, and so on and so forth, the picture is much more complicated and therefore we need many more data, but also, as I said, not only for monitoring, but also for managing. A clear conclusion is that uh, we have to go beyond, uh, of course, uh, the data. We need analytical models. Do you think that politicians who may have the availability of 200 plus indicators to understand how their country is going can get anything out of a list of 230 indicators? That would be exactly uh, the way to produce the data confusion in which everybody could say, yes, but this is improving. And this is what is going to happen, actually already happened. So here there is a big issue in terms of uh, condensing and uh, presenting, uh, aggregating this information in a meaning, meaningful way. But of course, you also need models to do simulations, uh, scenarios, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, especially for sustainability analysis, you don't understand anything about where you are. Because you can see that your capital is depleting, but it doesn't have a clue about the pathways towards uh, the goals in the future. So statisticians and uh, experts uh, in analytics and analytical models must work together, not only for now casting, as we heard this morning from the deputy director of, of uh, uh, JRC, which is very important in a sense, but it's not enough. Uh, in 2008, uh, the OECD and JRC published the only available handbook on how to build composite indicators. We are revising it now, but, and uh, I would, uh, let's say, advertise uh, for the JRC Competence Center on uh, composite indicators where th you have the best experts in the world. By the way, there is a proliferation of composite indicators. I think that this proliferation will end uh, when reaching the number of 365. So at least uh, every day you will have some headlines about your index, 366 every four years. Um, and this is not really helping uh, the comprehension of what's going on, especially because these data don't have any serious quality check. But this is an example of what's going on outside of official statistics. Official statistics are obsessed, rightly so, with quality. The others don't care. What are the obstacles in the world of official statistics? There are limited resources, weak positions in national administrations in some countries, but then also a wrong mindset. Especially in the European Union, 
where data are used for administrative purposes and people look at the 0.1 difference between the preliminary estimates and the final estimates or the ratio between deficit and GDP and so on and so forth, statistical offices and national accountants are really scared by doing any revision because revisions are seen as mistakes. So we shouldn't be surprised. Of course, they are also worried uh, because of newcomers, and they are very negative on model-based data. Well, of course, they, everybody's using models. Uh, even when you uh, do a survey, you're using the model. But especially in national accounts, there is uh, an opposition to try to use models or model-based to do estimates. Can we avoid to do that? No. What about CO2 emissions? Do, can you really hope to measure them in the air? No, you have to do some calculations. And this applies to most parts of the new field. In, for these reasons, uh, statistical offices are quite conservative and they are in the risk mitigation mode trying to avoid to make mistakes instead of being proactive or even leading the process. Think about the discussion between the role of statisticians and data scientists. So let me conclude. Where are we going? Is it uh, helpful what we are doing? Of course, yes. Can we hope uh, that uh, good data can change the world? Would the world be worse without data? Definitely, yes. But you have seen how long is the chain between producing figures and having an impact. And if you don't care about the other pieces of the chain, you risk to be systematically disappointed. Then, last slide, and I really stop. I recommend you to read uh, the Thinking the Unthinkable report. Recently published in UK for the ch Charter of Accountants, which are not really the most uh, dynamic uh, <laughs> in our mind. This has been uh, done by two uh, by former journalists of the BBC and uh, uh, social researcher. And I think that uh, is one of the most interesting uh, reports I read recently. The point is about the fact that uh, uh, there are so many things are happening uh, that we were thinking that couldn't happen, that people feel completely lost. So the question is, why are we so bad in thinking ahead? about new emerging things. And by the way, this is very correlated uh, to the sustainable development issue. Migration is correlated to climate change in Africa. Uh, social unrest is due. So the chart has been also used to explain Brexit. If you go back to the chart, uh, after the conference, I think you, you will find it. <laughs> um, so there are some interesting uh, uh, insights from this report built on the interviews of 60 top managers, uh, uh, politicians, uh, who are, of course, mostly anonymous. Like the person who said this. The lies we tell to ourselves every day are stunningly large. And to some degree, we have to do it in order to get through the day and be paid, by the way. But no senior official, no CEO fails to have information. It's always there. It's a question of whether you look for it hard enough. And when you find it, you pay attention to it. It's too easy to explain away inconvenient truth, say the one business leader. This is absolutely true. But there is an additional point. 
Some of us are advising uh, decision makers, uh, policy makers, and so on. The demands of frankness and honesty here are austere. Carrierists and yes men who are not warming their ministers are not doing their job. But the penalties for chicken little, the sky is falling and then it's not happening, are huge. So our system reward to keep calm, don't make a crisis, instead of uh, rewarding Cassandras. Our system don't reward uh, whistleblowers. Our systems punish them. What it says also is that because we are in a mess and politicians feel under stress and they don't trust that their technicians know how to fix them, they say, I prefer to be wrong by myself. And they don't listen anymore. They're experts. So there is a fracture, there is a break between those who know and those who should make decisions. But this is also an interesting point. If you are asked to write a policy brief and you know that the ministers don't really go to read it and that the ministers actually ask his or her advisors, much less knowledgeable than you on a topic, to write a brief that's more likely to get a hearing, how much effort are you going to make on your own policy brief? So this disconnection between uh, scientists and politicians is another growing uh, impediment to have uh, the chain uh, data, statistics, knowledge, and policy working. So a lot of challenges ahead, a lot of problems. So my main conclusion is don't be naive and work hard.